from our 22 News Broadcast Center, this is 22 News in Focus. Good Sunday afternoon and welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm Laura Hutchinson. You spend a lot of your hard-earned money on taxes every year to the state and we all want to know that our money is well spent and that's where 22 News in Focus comes in today. We'll talk to the state auditor who is watching our money for us. We'll talk about everything from mass health audits to charter schools and housing programs in our state. Then later we'll expand on the topic of housing and talk about what one organization is doing to make a difference in both the area of housing but also the health crisis facing our region. But first, let's begin today with Massachusetts State Auditor Suzanne Bunt. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, Laura. This is my first time having you on this program, so I'm really excited to have you here and just be able to talk about what it is that you're working on. So thanks for coming. This is great. Now, you were elected in 2010, I believe you've been in office. That's right. Talk to me about why you wanted to get into this to, to begin with. Well, I've spent a lot of my professional life in and around government. Uh, from 1985 till 1993, I was a state representative. I lived at that time in the town of Braintree, just south of Boston, and I uh, was first a legislative aide, and then I became a state representative for eight years. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I was out of government for a long time and sat on a number of boards in the Chamber of Commerce, and I uh, had work for big companies and little companies. But I got back into government with Deval Patrick when he uh, became governor. I was his Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development. And so I went from making policy to making sure that the policies were properly implemented. And I got very focused, therefore, on government operations and effectiveness and outcomes. And as I was getting more and more involved in that work, I started to see the opportunity for that kind of focus, that mm -hmm. kind of attention um, on government activity in the auditor's office. And so when the, the then uh, incumbent state auditor, Joseph DiNucci, announced in 2009, end of mm -hmm. 2009, that he was going to retire, uh, that he wasn't going to run uh, for a let's see, a seventh term. He'd already spent 24 mm -hmm. years in the auditor's office. I decided that I would run. Nice. So the, you know, the role of the auditor is to, uh, as, as you suggest, uh, uh, it's to be the chief accountability agent in government, mm -hmm. asking agencies, how did you spend the money? You know, where did you spend it? Did you follow the rules? Uh, but more, just as importantly now, uh, what can we do better? Mm -hmm. How can we do this better? How can we make sure that the taxpayers are well served? It must be a rewarding job, I would imagine. Um, on one end, when you find something that's not good, but also when you find something that is, to be able to sort of show the story no matter what it is. That's right. For the, the tagline for our office and our sort of operating motto for all of us in the office is making government work better. Mm -hmm. um, so in obviously in audits, you do a lot of fault finding, um, but you don't do it in a vacuum. You do it with a purpose, and that's to help agencies change the way uh, they are delivering services, the way they're spending money, uh, the way they are protecting taxpayer interests, uh, and so it is. You know, we we get to we get to help government make better decisions, and help make legislators make better decisions about policy as well. So how does it work? When do you decide that you are going to audit a certain department? How do you choose them? And how long does it take? T take me down this process. Well, so the, the law requires, you know, I work under, uh, under uh, laws as well, and the law requires that we are to um, audit every uh, it Department of State Government every three years, and we try our best to uh, to do that. It's obviously a matter of resources for us too, but um, but what we audit when we do an audit in an agency is completely up to us. I uh, and we have been using over the past few years since I've been there, and we've enhanced our ability to uh, to use data and to do data analysis. Um, we've developed a sort of a, a what we call a risk engine. So we can we know what agencies are spending money on. We can see what their priorities are. And we can use these very sophisticated computer models to give us a risk score for an agency. And that helps us 
pinpoint what it is that we're going to audit within an agency. So if we're going to audit the Department of Public Health, we want to audit an, a part of the, of the programs where there's uh, a lot of money um, at risk, where there is a question in the minds of the public about mm -hmm. the effectiveness of, uh, of services. And so we, we use the risk model. We look at what legislators are interested in, what the public, what we're hearing from in the media. You folks actually mm -hmm. are a great source of, uh, of information, uh, uh, focusing consumer attention on issues and the like. So we use all, a combination of all of those things mm -hmm. to decide what it is that we're going to audit. Um, within an agency. And then a typical audit will take six to nine months. Uh, we, uh, we sit down with the agency or the state contractor because we can also audit uh, vendors, people who contract with the state to provide a s service mm -hmm. rather than state employees do it. And uh, so we can audit them too. When we sit down with them, tell, me what, tell them what we're looking for kind of information they need to produce and we'll see that they're, that they're following the rules, we'll analyze their outcomes, uh, see what we're getting for the money that's, that's being paid and we'll produce, uh, we'll produce an audit. And so when we have an audit come out, how many people worked on that? You know, you said it takes like seven to nine months or so. How many people take that? Well, the typical audit team is three people, mm -hmm. uh, two field auditors and a supervisor. But then that supervisor works under a manager um, who will have a number of, uh, of, of supervisors and teams going at any, at any point. And then we have a director for each of the areas. So we have a director for our audits of mass health. We have a director for our audits of uh, the judiciary and law enforcement agencies and the like. So we have, uh, so but but three people mm -hmm. will will have worked directly on that audit. Now you said that you sometimes will follow something that is making news or headlines. Right. Um, one thing that we've been talking about a lot in just the last few years is this risk of identity theft. I mean, it's something that's been mm -hmm. going on for a very long time. But I know that you focused in on identity theft and risk with computer technologies and that sort of thing. Um, and you actually found some confidential information at risk at 12 state agencies. Talk to me about that audit. That must have been a big undertaking. Well, um, we did. We looked at. At the uh, at one aspect of IT security at uh, as you say a dozen different agencies and what we what we looked at was what they were doing uh, when they were either declaring uh, their computer equipment to be surplus or sometimes the state leases equipment rather than buys it and they give it back to the mm. uh, to the you know the company from whom they've uh, they've leased it or they're just going to junk um, some uh, some uh, equipment and you're supposed to be wiping all of the information clean before you put a piece of uh, of equipment that you've been using in in state service uh, yeah, out Mm -hmm. uh, out um, in the back in the private in the private sector, uh, because you think about the kinds of confidential information right. that gets kept, uh, all kinds of information about health status, never mind financial information, and and some of the agencies that are dealing with troubled families, a lot of personal information is kept on state computers. And what we found was uh, that none of the agencies that we looked at uh, were following all of the rules and following all the processes that they were supposed to in order to ensure that all of the information was being wiped clean before we, as I said, declared mm -hmm. a surplus or junked it or gave it back to the, uh, uh, the original company. Um, and so that's, that's uh, obviously a, a tremendous area of, of concern. Mm -hmm. We also found that agencies um, weren't taking all of the steps that they need to to ensure that once an employee um, has left, that they no longer have access to the computer. It's pretty easy, you know, as we're finding, sure. to get back into a system. And if your passwords haven't been deactivated, if, you're, if your access hasn't been shut down, then you could get in and cause mischief, uh, mm -hmm. either by altering files or by taking information. Uh, so we pointed out these deficiencies to those, uh, those 12 agencies. And they covered public service and transportation agencies, human, uh, 
uh, public safety agencies sure. as well. And so when you issue a report like that, how long does, um, do the agencies have to then come back with a, hey, we fixed this, you know, and do you then re-audit? How does that work just to ensure that some of these, you know, safety changes are being made? Uh, we go back after six months. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a new procedure that I actually we just instituted um, over the past few years because I said, why would we wait until the next audit right. to find out whether they've done this or not? Because right. the next audit won't occur for another three or four years. Right. So I said, let's go back after six months and find out how they're doing uh, and whether our, our recommendations uh, were actually helpful um, to, to, to or do they need to, so that we would know whether they need to change a law in order to accomplish mm -hmm. uh, what, what we think they ought to do. So we go back every si after six months and they report, uh, the, uh, they report to us, it's not an audit, but mm -hmm. they report to us on the progress that they're making and over 90%, we see that over 90% of our recommendations have either been implemented or are in the process of being implemented. So, so the work that we do um, is being taken seriously uh, by, state, by state agencies. And what about that small percentage of people who aren't implementing changes? You know, is there any mandatory, you know, to make some of those changes? No, there's, there's no requirement that mm -hmm. agencies uh, heed our recommendations. Um, that's why it's really important to us that we get it right. In the right. in the first instance, mm -hmm. so that we have credibility, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that we do check in with them. Sometimes they don't implement a recommendation because they fundamentally disagree uh, with us. Uh, they 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 push back and they say, "Look, we just think you're off base. We think that we followed the rules, or that the systems that we have are adequate, and mm -hmm. we're just not going to." We're just not going to do it. But some of those more serious findings then might pique the interest of lawmakers, as you said, and this could lead to change on that level. That's right. That's right. And 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 so um, sometimes even if the problems that we find don't require a legislative solution, the legislature will step in and fix things. Uh, they we found that they did that. We're very. Um, excited to to do that in the area of special education mm -hmm. collaborative services. Yeah. It is so interesting to hear about what you have happening and how this works. Um, we're going to take a short break and then we'll continue our conversation with State Auditor Suzanne Bump after this and we'll discuss some more recent audits that could save you money in the long run. Stay with us. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking with State Auditor Suzanne Bump about what her office does to protect Massachusetts residents. She oversees how our tax dollars are, are spent and ensures government agencies are providing quality services and working efficiently. Thank you so much again for being here. I appreciate it. Now you've recently audited Mass Health, which is one of, if not the largest part of our state budget. Um, and it was a pretty significant audit that you released, finding um, unnecessary spending or not taking advantage of savings that sort right. of added up to around 230 plus million dollars. Right. Talk to me about that audit. That must have been a huge undertaking and talk to me about the findings of that too. Um, I'd be happy to. You know, Mass Health, you're absolutely right. It's the biggest single item of spending in state government. Uh, oh, 30 plus percent of our $38 billion budget goes to spending on mass health, mm -hmm. which is the state's Medicaid program. And so uh, while I said that we audit agencies every three years, mass health, we are constantly auditing. We have mm -hmm. a group of people actually, and they are headquartered in Chicopee, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, um, that are always conducting multiple audits of different aspects of mass health. So the latest one that we did was uh, we looked at the use of managed care organizations by Mass Health. So um, Mass Health, like a lot of health insurers, and that's essentially what Mass Health is, mm -hmm. um, has managed care organizations uh, that coordinate the care and cover the costs of the medical services mm -hmm. for those for, for the members that are enrolled in it. Uh, there are five of them that we looked at over a five-year uh, period and what we found was that even though MassHealth had a contract with these managed care organizations, 
um, that listed the services that they were supposed to provide uh, and where they were paying the managed care organizations to provide these services, we saw that if a medical provider, a doctor, a hospital, a therapist, sent a bill for services directly to MassHealth instead of the managed care organization, MassHealth was paying it. Mm -hmm. So they were es essentially paying twice for services because they were paying the regular fee to the managed care organization and they were supposed to be paying the bills, but MassHealth was doing it itself. And so we saw over a, over a five year period, $233 million in duplicative payments. Um, the, it was really interesting because this, the, this sh obviously shouldn't have been happening, mm -hmm. uh, particularly since the state has been running managed care programs in mass health for 20 years. So there should not be any confusion on the part of mass health or the managed care organizations as to who is supposed to pay what. And yet the contracts just didn't have the enough specificity mm. um, and mass health didn't have its own claims administration system set up to say, hey, you know, this is a, supposed to be a bill that's paid for by the managed care organizations. We're going to deny it and we're going to tell that doctor, bill the managed care organization. That system was not at work within Mass Health, And so that's a substantial amount of, of money right. because they didn't have contracts with enough specificity and then they didn't have an efficient claims administration system. So we were talking in the last segment about how, again, these are recommendations when you come back with these odds, but that's a lot of money that we're talking about. It is. So what kind of response have you it gotten is. and is there anything mandatory there for change? Well, there were, um, there were some areas where they absolutely agreed with us. Um, for instance, uh, it's pretty clear in the contracts that emergency dental care uh, is supposed to be covered by the managed care organizations. And we showed MassHealth, look at all of these instances where you were paying for it. And they said, yep, absolutely right. That's, uh, that's uh, so we're going we're gonna to fix that. So mm -hmm. they have already started to, to fix that. There was another area where they, we said, um, here are state agencies that are providing medical services because the Department of Public Health or somebody that's in the custody of the Department of Youth Services would get a medical service uh, that was covered under managed care but Mass Health was paying and they said, oh yeah, maybe you are right about that. That was, I think, another th 43, 34 million dollars, and they said we're going to tighten. We're going to tighten that up. But there was still over 100 million dollars where they didn't agree um, with us. They, they, so the jury is still out mm. uh, as to what they're going to do. But we'll check back in a few months to see what actions they are, they are taking. But this is one, as I said, we've done a lot of audits. We're always auditing in here. It's one of a series of audits where we have found that Mass Health is just not doing a very good job of managing its claims payment systems, right. um, and it is uh, it's at enormous cost to the to the taxpayers, and and we certainly don't want to put people's uh, health and medical care in uh, in jeopardy. Um, so it's really important that they get it right. Uh, right because the costs are so enormous. Right, we all have the same goals here. Right. Even Mass Health would would say we want to do things efficiently and provide good health care for, right. for everyone. Um, now I know that your office also found that Mass Health paid 3 million in fraudulent claims. Um, there's that fraud portion of this and uh, you have mentioned sort of obtaining subpoena power when we talk about fraud. Talk to me right. about that and what sort of power you would like to like to have. Well, so in addition to the audits that we do of state agencies, we also have responsibility for determining whether there is uh, fraudulent use of public assistance programs. Mm -hmm. Public assistance programs um, like uh, Medicaid, like MassHealth, or welfare programs as we know them, food stamps and the like. And we have a group of investigators uh, who look into those possibilities of, uh, of fraud by individuals uh, and uh, we had a we we've gotten as I said going back to computer technology we're getting more sophisticated about being able to spot 
suspicious looking use of, uh, mm -hmm. of benefits and, uh, and the like. And so last year identified over $9 million worth of public assistance fraud, um, which is really a record for us. Mm -hmm. Not because, we, and we, again, we, we think the numbers are going up not because there's m more f or higher rate of fraud, but we're just doing a better job of detecting the <laughs> fraud. There you go. <laughs> so one of the things that we want to do so that we can uh, successfully close even more investigations is get su uh, the power to subpoena individuals' financial records. Uh, the law says right now that we can gain access to the bank records or other records of someone who's receiving public assistance and whom we are investigating for fraud. But banks and other institutions uh, want to see a subpoena uh, in order to turn over those records. They're supposed to do it without a subpoena, but their lawyers say, no, we really want to have a subpoena. But right now, we don't have subpoena authority to mm -hmm. get those records. So we, we're looking to, um, we filed legislation uh, it, that's received a public hearing. Uh, and we are hoping that the Judiciary Committee will report favorably on this because 10% of the cases that we investigate, we have to close without reaching a final conclusion um, even when though we suspect there's fraud because we can't get access to the records to, to find it out. If, if we were to go to court uh, for each subpoena that we're looking for, we'd be tied up in court for months and months on end. So we end up closing these cases. If we could just subpoena those records directly, we'd be able to complete more cases and I'm sure find more fraud. Right. Sounds like that would be a, a pretty nice change and could make yeah. some real change in the state yeah. statewide it, for sure. It really would. Okay. We'll continue this conversation with State Auditor Suzanne Bump after this. Stay with us. You're watching 22 News in Focus. You're watching 22 News in Focus. We are continuing our conversation now with State Auditor Suzanne Bump. Again, thank you so much for being here. In a little bit, we'll expand on some of the topics that we've discussed here. But first, let's cover a few more recent audits. Um, one thing I do want to talk about is I know that you're in charge of enforcing the Pacheco Law. Right. And this winter, there was a lot of talk about the MBTA and how the system basically fell apart. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's true. Now there's a debate over the state's uh, privatization law. So let's let's talk about what some people are advocating for and what your thoughts are on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Pacheco law is the name given uh, to the legislation, the law, that governs how it is that the state decides whether to give a private contractor a contract to provide services that state employees had, sure. have mm -hmm. formally up till up till then provided and what it requires for state agencies to do is actually something that state agencies don't always do um, which is before they make a decision about uh, a, about major thing like how they're going to operate a program um, they have to do essentially a cost benefit analysis they have to look at the costs that that it, they are incurring to provide a service mm -hmm. um, and then they have to solicit bids from private companies uh, and, and bring that information to the auditor's office so that we can determine that there's actually going to be a benefit to the taxpayer if the service is contracted out sure. to the private sector. Um, the governor, when he provided uh, a set of recommendations and some legislation that he wanted the the legislature to act on uh, so that he could more readily fix the MBTA said one of the things I want you to do is get rid of the Pacheco law. Mm. Uh, now the legislature decided that they would suspend the Pacheco law for three years uh, so that he can contract make contracts um, without those those um, processes mm -hmm. uh, I have a lot of concern about that as the Chief Accountability Officer for the right. Commonwealth. You would think that you would want this to occur, that you would want that level of accountability, especially since when we have seen services privatized uh, in the past, uh, we see that the contracts typically just get renewed because in fact there aren't really a lot of people that clamor to do some of these big tasks. For instance, when they privatized commuter rail, mm. um, the last time they put it out to bid, there was only one other bidder. Mm. Uh, so you know, you don't really know if you're getting good service, and it never really comes back to state government. It's always 
Sure. It's always, once it's privatized, it stay private, stays privatized, even when there have been problems with the service. So, mm -hmm. so after, after commuter rail, for instance, got privatized, uh, and after other real estate services at the MBTA uh, got privatized, the auditor's office did audits and found all kinds of problems right. that the state was incurring more costs and the contracts weren't being followed. And there's already a deep sense of frustration in the western part of the state. You know, the latest transportation bill, the largest percentage of that money went to the MBTA, right. which we're paying for out right. here, of course. And right. um, you know, a lot of people aren't taking advantage of the MBTA because no. it's 90 minutes down the road. No, and as a Western Mass resident myself, living mm -hmm. in Great Barrington as I do, right. I can really appreciate mm -hmm. um, the uh, the fact that uh, Western Mass often gets the short end of the stick. And so, uh, with that in mind, but then also just this general principle that shouldn't agencies be forced to do a cost-benefit analysis that before they make a big decision like that? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, I'm a defender of this law that uh, that other people see as as just a, a bureaucratic obstacle and just delays, you know, just a lot of rigmarole. Well, I think that's rigmarole that's in the public interest. And so do you think that this will be reversed? I guess what's happening No, now I think that? the legislature was pretty, pretty clear. They're going mm -hmm. to give the governor three years to um, uh, to do this at the MBTA, but we, um, but we're also seeing signs on Beacon Hill are hearing that that there are other things that he's going to want to uh, to privatize, and for and for some people who advocate repeal of the Pacheco law in its entirety, right. we know that that battle is going to continue. So that'll be interesting. We'll hear about that. You will. Um, also, um, as far as the homeless program goes, which we do have a, a couple of folks here later on in the program who are talking about what they're doing to sort of curb homelessness and some other social issues in the community. But I know that um, one effort that you've put forth that has to do with the transportation and how much the state is spending on um, transporting homeless kids from right. school to home. Right. Talk to us about that. Good. Well, with this, we've I think we've been able to touch on every one of the different aspects of my <laughs> office. We've talked talked about auditing, we've talked about public assistance fraud, uh, we just talked about the Pacheco law, and now this is our, um, our division of local mandates. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that the law requires us to do um, is to uh, take issues that local communities uh, bring to the state and, and uh, for which they say, hey, the state is requiring us in local government to take this action to spend this kind of, of money, right. um, we think that under the law it's something that the state should be paying for, mm -hmm. that our local taxpayers shouldn't have to be paying for. So it's the state auditor who gets to uh, make the legal decision about what the law is and then also do the financial mm -hmm. assessment of what the, the financial impact sure. is. And so we had communities that came to us and said, we've got a lot of kids that are being in homeless families that are being placed in motels and other sure. temporary housing in our communities. Under the law, um, those kids can go to school here in our in the temporary sure. um, host community, mm -hmm. or they can go back to school in their home district, which is a great idea, obviously, for educational continuity and stability Sometimes for these far, kids. Though. But that's it. And and under the law, the municipalities were responsible for sharing mm -hmm. those costs. And what when we found, looking at the law, that really the state should be paying for this. It shouldn't be up to the local taxpayers to do it. Um, and that the costs on a statewide basis were running 11, 12, I think it's up to 13 or 14 million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And that's just the cost for the transportation. Um, and never mind the costs of other education services uh, for children who show up really unannounced in the mm -hmm. middle of the school year and may require special services. And so we said to the legislature, you know, you're, you are putting a burden on the municipalities to pay for this. Clearly we want to do the right thing for these children and mm -hmm. for their for their parents. We want them to have services. We want them to be as stable as we can make them. Um, but the state needs to be stepping up to the plate here. Um, in response to that, the state has put um, some money towards the transportation. Um, and we are, we just keep 
pushing away and municipalities keep pushing away at the legislature saying you've got to start paying for more of this mm -hmm. because everybody wants to do the right thing and help these help these kids and their families um, but let's be honest about what it costs mm -hmm. and about where the legal responsibility for paying for those services sure. lies and uh, homelessness obviously it's a very complex problem and it uh, and when you're talking about homeless families it really really tugs on your mm -hmm. on your heartstrings um, and and as I say, we want to make sure that we're that we're providing them with the, the optimal services. Right. That, well, that's a huge topic that's yeah. impacted us a lot here. We have many in the hotels here. It's not only the transportation, as you were talking about, also the impact on um, you know public response, yeah. um, police officers, the right. police departments. There's there's a huge impact there. Right. So it, it is a big issue, and uh, I think it's great that you raised awareness yeah. on that. Thank you so much. Well, it, that, yeah, that's all right. And we have I mean, we found that as well that ten ten communities are shouldering most of this burden, and two of them are in your listening area. Chicopee, right. Chicopee and Holyoke yeah, well um, are, prepare, are, are, are um, really sharing a disproportionate burden. Yeah. Uh, well, it is a big topic. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. We are going to expand mm -hmm. on the topic of homelessness with another organization. But I want to thank you so much for coming on and talking it's to really us. It's really been a pleasure. Audit been a pleasure. Thank Thanks. you so much. We covered a lot of ground we here. <laughs> we did. And next we'll find out what one local organization is doing to help your neighbors in need. Stay with us. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. We've been talking with State Auditor Suzanne Bump about some of the recent audits. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the social services that we discussed. Joining us now, we have two representatives for the Center for Human Development. We have Jane Banks here, the Program Director for Homeless Services, and we have Kim Lee, Vice President of Development, Marketing, and Communications of the Center for Human Development. Thank you both so much for being here. I really Thank appreciate you for it. Us. So we we were actually just talking about homelessness, and I know that that is one issue that you are working on tackling locally here. Um, but let's first just start off by talking to us about what the center does what sort of services do you offer who are you trying to impact sure mm -hmm. actually it's um it's a it's a interesting story in terms of how the Center for Human Development or CHD was actually founded um, for individuals in the community who had been working very closely in the social service sector um, in the world of nonprofits actually gathered together around one of their kitchen tables one afternoon and over a cup of coffee decided you know we could probably do this kind of work a lot better, um, making sure that folks who are in need or who are in um, critical conditions where they need immediate access to services or programs would be treated with dignity and, mm -hmm. and with respect. And so those four individuals were responsible um, back in 1972 for founding the Center for Human Development. So correct me if I'm wrong, but we were just talking about state audits and you know state programs. This is sort of an alternative for people locally. Um, instead of going through the state system, this one is local. Or how exactly does that work? How would somebody walk through your door? Sure. So the Center for Human Development is a non profit agency. We mm -hmm. are a 501c3 organization, mm -hmm. which means our programs are funded by um, or run through either private philanthropic um, foundation mm -hmm. funding or individual donations. But the majority of our funding comes to CHD through either federal and or state funded contracts for programs and services. So many of our programs are open referrals. So our outpatient clinics, for example, um, our foster care programs, um, you know, some of our other family supports, um, early intervention services. Um, but programs like um, our homeless services, for example, come through closed referrals or very specific contracts that Jane could probably talk a little bit more about. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's do that. So we were just talking about um, the homeless issue, the problem that is affecting communities across the board, um, and it's impacting financially, it's, you know, it's emotionally difficult for the community, it's not good for anyone, really. So talk to me about um, what options are available for people who come to your door. What, what do you have available as far as that goes? So we're, as Kim referred, 
for just a few minutes ago, we are a closed referral from mm -hmm. the state. So all of our families come in through the Department of Housing and Community Development, mm -hmm. or DHCD. And so what we do is we have a contract with the state or DHCD to do diversion work at the front door. So when families come in to apply for shelter or emergency assistance and they're eligible, they'll come to us first. We have staff located at the state office and they will try to keep a family housed where they are if they can stay there or divert them by getting them another apartment or work with another landlord. If that can't happen, then they'll come into shelter with us. So what does the demand look like as far as how many people are needing help and how many shelters are actually available? Because we sort of hear about this revolving door of folks. Are there more people? becoming homeless now? How, how are we doing in that area? Well, I think that we're doing pretty good. So we have um, between the Center for Human Development, HAP Housing, and New England Farm Workers, and ServiceNet for Franklin County, we have been able to reduce the number of families living in the, in the motel significantly. Mm -hmm. The start of last fiscal year, we had about 300 to 350 families in this region. Uh, we're down to about 118, mm -hmm. I think, in Hamden County, and maybe about 30 in Franklin County. So that number has dropped significantly. And part of the reason for that is because the, there's been a significant push for providers in the state to be able to get those families housed, get them back to their areas of meaningful ties, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the diversion work that we're doing at the front door. So the state last year contracted with a few of the providers statewide, CHD is one of them, and at the beginning of the fiscal year last year, the state um, was diverting about three to five percent of the families at the front door. By the end of fiscal year 15, which was June 30th, we were up to about 20 percent, and wow. our goal statewide is about 30 percent. Wow, that's great. Now, we've been covering this for years, and we see the numbers fluctuate. So, do you see us on a pretty solid downward trend in reducing those numbers? Or are you anticipating a spike? Is there a certain time of year when it would typically spike in maybe the colder months? Or what well, we're are you seeing expecting? a decrease in the motels, mm -hmm. but we had shelter expansion over the last couple of years, and so many of those families are in our shelter system. Okay. So we have shelter providers, which are Center for Human Development, HAP Housing, New England Farm Workers, and ServiceNet in this region. So we all provide shelter services. Um, and we generally will see a spike towards the end of summer when school is starting and families are wanting to be able to settle before mm -hmm. their kids start school. So we'll see a spike around then. Okay. Now, is this mostly economic based? I mean, maybe do you have any insight as to what is causing the homeless numbers to to remain in our area? Is it the economy? Are people moving in from out of state? Of course, we are a right to shelter state, mm -hmm. so that does um, you know make us a good option for people who might be in other states and and going through hard times. What are you seeing? Is it is it our economy? Is it that right to shelter? What do you think? Well, it's the economy. It, I think in part it's the right to shelter. I don't think that the right to shelter has a significant impact on who's coming from out of state, mm -hmm. um, but it is the economy. It's the lack of jobs. It, we have a really, um, we have a housing shortage. I think statewide, most certainly in this region, um, and we have a lack of housing that families can support. Whether it's it's um, uh, subsidized housing, Section 8, market rate, we just really have a shortage, and it's hard to be able to place families and meet the. Um, you know, their income and the rent need and the mm -hmm. rent amounts. Well, when, when we talk about homeless, um, we are sometimes talking about those people who are fighting substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Of course, that leads to homelessness, and I know that you offer a lot of services mm -hmm. for those types of folks. So let's take a short break, and when we come back, we'll, we'll pick up there. Stay with us. We'll continue our conversation. After the break, you're watching 22 News in Focus. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Earlier in the program, we were talking about government oversight with the state auditor, and now we're talking about social services with representatives from the Center for Human Development. We have Jane Banks here, Program Director for Homeless Services, and we have Kim Lee, Vice President of Development, Marketing, and Communications, both for the Center for Human Development. Again, thank you again so much for being here. When we left off, we were talking about uh, curbing homelessness in the community, and of course, uh, one aspect that can lead to homelessness is uh, the opioid crisis that we've been talking about statewide, um, the heroin, drug, substance abuse. So talk to me. I know that you offer services as far as that goes. What do you have as far as that's concerned? 
Well, we, um, in addition to our outpatient um, mental health clinics, mm -hmm. um, which are available in Springfield as well as Holyoke um, and um, Greenfield, Franklin County, Hamden County, we also have programming, which a lot of folks don't know, in Connecticut as well, as well as Worcester. Um, but there are outpatient clinics that, that would be available. In fact, um, it's, um, it's wonderful in that we were just recently the recipient of a um, BSAS grant, which is the Bureau of Substance Abuse Adult Services, I think. <laughs> um, another acronym in our world of um, social services but it provides um, immediate access to addiction services as well as gambling um, addiction Great. for adults without insurance. So a lot of the programs that um, CHD has available in the community, which would be available through an insurance provider or um, through, through a third party, this particular grant provides immediate access for folks who don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And so it's just another opportunity available for people who are in the community who may be suffering with um, an addiction to alcohol or to other drugs to come into CHD and to get the help that they need to, to live a substance-free life. And are you finding that that's one area where demand is increasing? Very, very much so. Very much so. There are, and I think because there it has been so much focus from the media, um, from the broader community, from the state on the issue that parents are educating themselves, school districts are educating themselves, and so as people become much more informed and open uh, having a dialogue on this particular topic, it then affords individuals the opportunity to then seek the help that they may need mm -hmm. um, or to find the information that they need in order to get themselves into a program or to get their loved one into a program mm -hmm. um, or to a student who they might be working with. Well, th that's good to know because I know that one of the state's goals was to simply raise awareness of the issue. Um, so when people walk in the door with some kind of abuse, um, addiction, anything, what can they expect? What are sort of the different branches that you would offer to somebody? Well, in addition to our um, clinics, which again are located, we have one on State Street in Springfield, we have mm -hmm. a, um, a clinic in, in Holyoke, Franklin County. Um, you know, the first thing, what differentiates, I'd like to thank um, CHD from other providers of similar services is the way, again, which gets back to the kitchen table conversation back in 1972, is that people are really welcomed at the place that they are. Um, they're welcomed warmly. Um, there is a sympathetic um, and responsive ear ready to help them at whatever point they may be in their addiction. Mm -hmm. Individuals who are very, very well versed, um, very experienced, um, really experts in the field of substance abuse um, and addiction ready, willing, and able to assist, and not just the individual who's using themselves, but the family, because when an individual um, is abusing, it affects the entire family. So yeah. it's not just the one person who needs to recover, it's mm -hmm. the entire family um, that needs to recover. And so those are other supportive services that we would provide in addition to just the one-on-one -on -one or individual um, addiction counseling. Well, it's great to know that those resources are available. That is something that's impacting every community, really, in Western Mass. Um, and I know that you also offer uh, intervention services for, for young kids as well. And this is something that people might, might not be aware of. It isn't typically what you would think of when you think of CHD. You know, certainly Jane's programs um, and um, all of the homeless diversion and stabilization work um, that she and, and her team do um, tirelessly is um, you know, our mental health services are things that we may be more well known for, but early intervention is a wonderful program that's offered through CHD that is available free of charge. And it is for families um, with children ages zero to three whose, um, main, whose children may not be reaching particular or certain milestones. So by the time a child is six months old, you know, milestone might be that they're that they're babbling, mm -hmm. um, that they're responsive, that um, there is a particular kind of head movement. And so if a parent recognizes or if a pediatrician recognizes that the child may not be quite developing on track as he or she should be, the pediatrician can send the parents through a referral to CHD where we actually do um, home visiting. 
So we'll go out to where the family is, which is extremely important because we do serve a large percentage of low-income families where transportation to services or programs is an obstacle. So mm -hmm. we actually go out into families' homes and we provide that intervention. So occupational therapy might be something we would engage the family in. Um, increasing their exposure to literacy and to early learning skills. So um, it's a, a fairly, um, and I want to say a large program, um, but it's a, a big program that serves quite a few families here in, in uh, Western Massachusetts. And also um, family therapy in general is when problems arrive within the home. I know that that's something else that you focus on as well, is keeping the family you know, on a positive path. We do. We have a wonderful program in home therapy, mm -hmm. um, which again is an opportunity for our clinicians, social workers, case managers to go in and to work with parents around be the behavior of their children, um, you know, individual plans, individual goals, um, opportunities for um, parents to learn and to develop their own skills. We tell a lot of our parents um, who are in our program that, you know, you don't have to parent the way you were parented. Mm -hmm. There's opportunities for you to change your own behavior, which will have a direct impact on how your child is behaving as well. Okay. Go ahead. I think it's important to note, too, that in our shelter system and in our stabilization, so once families have, have been placed in permanent housing, our families have access to all of the services that's that great. CHD has oh, to offer. Great. It's not just for you know folks in the community, but it's also for our own families and our own children. We make referrals to the agency to be able to provide the additional support that families need. Yeah, that's great. It's an excellent point because, and Jane is right, you know, we have CHD serves 17,000 individuals a year. Wow. We have 70 different programs and as we had mentioned, we're, we're in Connecticut, we're in Greenfield, we're in um, Northampton, we're in Amherst. We have, you know, some wonderful smaller programs, some family outreach of mm -hmm. Amherst and um, Not Bread Alone, which is a community um, meal feeding program. So if you come in to CHD through one point of intervention, and perhaps that's early intervention or that's the homeless diversion and stabilization programs, mm -hmm you have this huge blanket of additional supports and services that are available to you to help with any other need or crisis that you may have in your family at, at that particular time. And it sounds like many of these services are free to people, which is which is very good, all the, right? They are, <coughs> and it's really interesting. This morning, uh, there was actually a, um, a situation that visualizes or helps to visualize what we just talked about in terms of families and that CHD mm -hmm. blanket and that we were working with a young mom in our early intervention program who has a very disabled child. Um, blind and also um, has cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. The mom is in need of housing and needed access to um, perhaps, you know, some, well, she did need additional help in terms of mental health services. So the early intervention um, specialist who she's working with is able to then call Jane and have a conversation oh. about potential housing Great. and then have a conversation with one of our clinicians about what mom needs from a mental health perspective. Mm -hmm. And then a call went out to all staff around clothing right. that was needed for the two-year-old. So, so from talking to these families, you can kind of see where they can be best served within your program. That's great. Thank you both so much for coming on and talking to us about this. I really appreciate it. We will be putting your website on our website as well. People want to go in and learn more about it. Right. So thank you both so much for being here. And we'll have the last word for you after the break. Stay with us. You're watching 22 News in Focus. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today we talked with the state auditor about how she's watching your money and what changes she'd like to see. We also expanded on some of the topics we discussed after talking with an organization that helps people in our community here locally with health-related issues, homelessness, and services for the disabled. That is our program for today. We want to thank our guests for joining us. Thanks to you at home for watching. We hope you heard something today that can help you. If you've missed any of it, you can watch it in full on our website at wwlp.com. Com. From all of us here at 22 News, we wish you a wonderful Sunday. Take care.